Section 10 of Around the Clock in Europe, A Travel Sequence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Keith Salas. Around the Clock in Europe, A Travel Sequence by Charles Fish Howell. Section 10. Interlaken. 10 p.m. to 11 p.m. The top of the evening at brisk and bracing Interlaken is certainly ten o'clock. Vigorous, vitalizing air breathes down the lush meadows from towering alpine snowfields, and languor and ennui fall away from their dispirited summer idlers, and a refreshing life interest reasserts itself. It is then that one may see the deep flowered lawns that front the great hotels of the broad Hoveg, pleasantly thronged with animated guests modishly and immaculately groomed and each little street and quiet lane has its quota of vivacious strollers who prefer the keen night air and the inspiring mountain prospect to the conventional attractions of the brilliant curacao or the round of mild social diversions that is in progress in the hotel apartments then too there is a certain subdued note of expectancy in the air for this is the little village's fate hour and almost as the valley clocks are striking the hour the celebration is heralded with a burst of rockets from the open field of the hohenmatte in the centre of the town and there's a general rush of chattering guests to see the display and to exhibit prodigious approval all are aware of the fact that this is merely an expression in terms of swiss thrift of the appreciation the seventy-five hundred villagers feel for the lucrative presence of thousands of guests and yet it admirably serves as a mid-break in the evening's diversions there is little enough to the celebration to be sure excepting the exaggerated importance such an event always assumes to isolated summer people but you would think it was a pyrotechnic marvel to judge by the enthusiasm to see interlaken then is to behold her at her gayest bridge parties forsake their cards late diners their ices and billiardists their cues each little balcony in the hotel fronts is promptly crowded orchestras strike up lively strauss waltzes troops of delighted guests hurry across the hoveg and pour into the meadow until one might fairly conclude that there was a carnival on from the overflow of laughter and merrymaking it is always a great moment to the curacao there the excitement seekers have been wandering from parlors to lounging rooms and ending up in the cheery gaming hall where a toy train on a long green table darts around a little track laden with the francs and many hopes of the modest challengers of fortune and comes to an exciting and leisurely stop before some station with the name of a european capital just then like as not as a croupier begins raking in the scattered piles of silver and the losers are being gleefully accosted by their friends somebody suddenly shouts fireworks and forthwith all run hurrahing into the gardens and cry out like summer children in vast delight over the rockets that go hurling skyward from the hohenmatte it is all quite the nature of a very elegant international fete to which the old world and the new have accredited their most recherche representatives there is seldom a lack of keen activity at interlaken but at this hour it is most abounding nor will the new arrival fare to note the contrast between the sharp alertness of this company and the lethargic listlessness that depresses for instance the bored idlers who bask in the dusky olive gardens of the riviera in the intermittent glow of the fireworks cottages and distant hotels spring out of the surrounding darkness the top of a hillside sanatorium appears of a sudden white against the dark pines the pack saddle roof of the church tower discovers itself a turret shows with a red field and white greek cross of the swiss flag lazily unfolding above it and one looks anxiously for just one glimpse of the old cloister's round towers and cone-shaped roofs that reminded longfellow of all tapers with extinguishers music drifts down from remote cafes and pavilions nesting in the wooded nooks the air is heady and buoyant with a scent of pine and fir life seems at high tide and then just as suddenly it is all over and the gay company resumes its interrupted activities with infinite laughter and hand-clapping 
There is a positive spell to all this alpine comedy. No new arrival will feel inclined to return at once to hotel conventionalities, with a soft purple mist shrouding the Lauterbrunnen Valley and the distant Jungfrau lying pallid and wan in the moonlight. He will gaze about him in wonder at the snow-crowned peaks that hem in the little Bodelli plain where Interlaken snuggles, and will feel how wonderful it is that the boisterous Lucien and its fellow torrents could ever have filled this alluvial barrier between the deep lakes that fought them inch by inch. He will think of the enchanted regions of the Bernese overland that lie just before him, and of the contrasting beauty of the inland seas that stretch away on either hand, Lake Brienz, mysterious and austere, scowling at its precipitous mountain shores, roaring welcomes to its thundering waterfalls, and begrudging standing room for the tiniest of hamlets. Lake Thun, the Riviera of Switzerland, with lovely vistas of green meadows, chateau-dotted hillsides, and distant snowy summits, all breathing such mildness and serenity as befitted the former abode of the holy hermit of say Beatenberg, and doubtless he will seek out some tree-embowered path that winds along the Ara, and there indulge in contemplative thought of this glittering blue link between the lakes. Nor could he do better, for this arrogant stream is an illustrious instance of a reformed rake, of evil repute for riotous cascade and brawling torrent all the way up to its home by the Grimsel Pass, it responds to the touch of civilization at Interlaken, and meekly accepts the bondage of steam for the remainder of its career. What a gratifying example of reform it presents as it proceeds demurely along from this scene of moral crisis, laving thankful little towns, reporting conscientiously to the proper authorities at Bern, and after an exhibition review sweep around the capital, flowing sweetly on to the Waldschut and modestly lying down its burden on the broad bosom of the Rhine. The stranger will perceive that virtue has its rewards, with rivers as with humans, when he takes note of the extravagant petting and eulogy that has followed the repentance of the Ara at Interlaken, its adornment with promenades, gardens, and artistic bridges, and the choice of much excellent society, particularly at night, on the part of ruminating savants and romantic lovers of all ages. Strolling along the river paths carpeted with sweet-scented pine needles, the delighted new arrival has only to lift his eyes to discover how picturesquely the little city lies in its bed of lush and fertile meadows. It will seem to him like a great stage set for a mammoth spectacle, for background there is the black and flinty harder, set with the grim rock face of the scowling Hardemanli, rugged in boulders and sheer cliffs and hiding its base in treacherous, grassy slopes. The Ara skirts it fearfully, and the pretty little cottages of Untersin shrink close to Lake Thun on its farther side. Prostrate Interlaken lies supine before it, gazing appealingly through its innumerable windows across the open Hohenmatte, over the beeches and firs of the protruding shoulder of the Rugen, and up on the dodging, narrow Lutschen Valley, to the remote and sympathetic Jungfrau. The scene is ready for the curtain when you have dotted the mountain slopes with chalets. Or, perhaps, if the stranger is fanciful, he will conceive the alpine ravens, thinking it some enormous eagle swooping toward the Lauterbrunnen Valley, with clustered houses for an attenuated body and two lakes for powerful blue wings beating out and back. Or again, he may be reminded by this group of huge hotels of some fleet of old-time ships of the line that started down the valley to bombard the Jungfrau. Early in the action, formation was lost and the giant hulks drifted about in hopeless confusion. Several apparently went prominently aground on the banks of the Ara, right under the precipices of the Harder. All the big ones foundered in a row along the Hoveg. A number became desperately entangled in the square before the Spielmatten Island. Some trailed southward in what we call Jungfraustrasse, and others in Alpenstrasse. Here and there one lies at anchor along the farther meadows waiting for signals from the flagship of the Hoveg, and at last one, in the guise of an ugly white church, was caught in some violent cross-current and tossed up high and dry on the bow of the first smothered gustag. 
evening guest who does not fancy reveries along a mountain stream, nor yet the quiet pacing of the neat lanes that are so characteristic of this immaculate republic of spotless towns, whose very flag appropriately suggests the Red Cross Society's similar emblem of sanitation, will find it amusing to loiter along the little shops of the village and see the curious wooden trifles of Rienz and delicately tinted Mazzolico ware of Thun, exquisite ivory carvings and rare bijouterie of filigree silver, wrought with infinite patience and skill. Tiring of these, he may ramble under the fine old walnut trees of the Hoveg and congratulate himself that he is not under the horse chestnuts of Lucerne to look out on inferior mountain prospects and breathe a less intoxicating air. The most approved form of evening entertainment is a round of calls among friends scattered over the broad lawns of the hotels, when one may divert himself with summer orchestras or itinerant bands of Italian singers in crimson sashes, or revel in a rare profusion of beautiful flowers, and from time to time look gladly up at a crisp sky blended with great luminous stars whose tremulous ardor in Walter Pater's famous phrase burns like a gem. It is a capital place to gather impressions of what life at Interlaken means and what goes forward each day among its votaries. It is perfectly plain that this must be a great place. Everybody so bubblingly cheerful and so devoutly grateful for being just here in no possible spot else. You will hear them insisting that Interlaken, being halfway between, is an admirable combination of the complacent prettiness of Geneva and the austere solemnity of the vaunted Engadine Valley, or there will be fragments of conversation reaching you about tennis matches on the Hohenmate, like bathing in Briennes, motorbus runs from the golf links of Bonningen, where the residents plant a fruit tree whenever a baby is born, or the desperate scrambles up the zigzag trails of the harder beloved of Weber, Mendelssohn, and Wagner, with rapturous accounts of the inspiring view from the Kulm. Some, you will gather, have passed the day unevently among the park walks of the Rugen, gazing down on Lake Brienz from the Trinkhalle Café, or on Lake Thun from the Scheffel Pavilion, or on both from farther up on the Belvedere of the Heimwehflu. Others again, it seems, have actually crossed the mild Wagner ravine and ascended the lofty Abenberg of the Grosser Rügen, and for this pitiful adventure you hear them pose as veteran mountain conquerors who will carry their alpenstocks home with them, and forever after speak familiarly of Edelweiss and the flora of the summits. There even appear to have been romantic souls familiar with Madame de Stael's accounts of St. Berthold festivals, who have spent the hours and dreams of Byron's Manfred down by the old round tower of the dilapidated wreckage of Wunsbunen Castle, in truth the most abject of ruins and quite as forlorn as Marinara's moulted grange. Not a few will have the courage to confess that they have done nothing more heroic than stroll by the shaded Goldai promenades along the Ara until they came to Untersein, where they deliberately sat down and gazed to Sutayuti at the curious toy houses with long carved balconies and amazing roofs that project beyond all belief. Thus, by merely catching flying ends of talk, a stranger may imbibe the proper amount of enthusiasm and gather some rambling notion of fine things Interlaken has in store for him. But the real evening heroes must be looked for at the Kursau. That is where you hear the great champion talkers of the world. What was the amiable Tartarin to such as these, or Baron Munchausen, or Sir John Mandeville? On such deaf ears fell the warning ignored of Excelsior. Beware the pine tree's weathered branch. Beware the awful avalanche. Behold them at their ease in wicker chairs in the lounging rooms, stretching the weary limbs that have borne them in safety through a hundred alpine perils for all will listen what tales may be heard of desperate daring amid the imminent deadly breach of crevasse and avalanche. Under the vivid hand of the actual participant, one fairly sees the progress of the proud mountain Kvela, follows with bated breath the slow and tedious early stages, the hazardous upward advance, the surmounting of final barriers by dint of ice axe and life rope, and so enters into the joy of the ultimate conquest of the wild, 
bleak, wind-swept summit. Who would have the hardihood in such a presence to speak a word of such contemptible contrivances as mountain tramways and funicular railroads? It is enough that the uninitiated should realize in the shuddering depths of his soul that there still remains terra incognita to the listless, the fat, and the asthmatic. Later on, of course, we come to view these hardy characters in a somewhat truer perspective, but that will be after we have talked with their guides, or ourselves turned heroes and bluffed at like hazards. All the same, there is no denying the satisfaction a newcomer has in the beginning in ascending the impressive conversation of these desperate and intrepid Kurosawa adventures. He certainly feels that he has at last reached a region of hardy men and genuine mountain hand-to-hand -hand struggles. He hears with popping eyes of the lofty little hamlet of Muren, away up in Cloudland, whose tiny cottages stagger under broad stone-freighted roofs, and where vast sublime titans scowl awfully from inaccessible heights. They tell him it is a region of eternal dazzling whiteness, with patches of black here and there that are really forests half buried in snow, and where the air is stifling with the constant odor of ice and frost. A truly shuddering place, they say, where men cannot hear themselves talk for the incessant thundering of plunging avalanches and where the herdsman seldom ventures, and the sunrise is never heralded by the alphorn of the hardy sen. Later on, to be sure, we journey luxuriously to the same Muradin in a comfortable mountain railway, and with considerably less peril than attends going to office by elevator in a skyscraper at home. And we find it a green and peaceful retreat, well supplied with hotels and gratefully affected by delicate old ladies with weak lungs. Just the same, we would not have missed the thrills of that first Kurosawa account. Alas, for all disillusionment anyway. Most of the beautiful white velvety Edelweiss these rocking chair climbers produce from their pockets, in proof of their presence in frightful and remote ravines, has really been bought for a franc in the Holweg, and the chamois they stalked in summit passes generally dwindle down to the little ivory ones you find in the shops of the Jungfraustrasse. The truth of the Curacao, when you get it, is stranger than its fiction, as when the talk turns to the progress of the construction work on the Jungfrau Railway, that imperishable monument to the genius and patience of the late Adolf Geyer Zeller of Zurich. It is then you hear of the loftiest tunnels in the world, eight and ten miles long, through icy mountain shoulders ten thousand feet above the sea, of gradients of one and four, of squirrel locomotives so ingeniously contrived that if the electric power were suddenly to fail, they could generate enough by their own weight to clap on the brakes and come down in safety. Of searchlights in the stations on the peaks so strong that a man can read by them away over at Toon. Of powerful telescopes free to patrons, through which you may observe the occupations of the crowds on the Rigi and Mount Pilatus at remote Lucerne of roomy and luxurious stations blasted out of the depths of the mountains, whose floors are parquetry, and whose light and heat are electricity, with twenty-foot windows piercing the rock and appearing, even from across a neighboring abyss, like tiny pinpricks in the perpendicular cliff of the highest post office on earth, from whose windows you look out on twenty glaciers. Of the truth of all this, you are to learn later, on when you make the unforgettable run to Eismere, Sea of Ice, the farthest point so far attained in the steady progress of this marvelous railway toward the summit of the Jungfrau, now only a mile or two beyond, and which had been the despair of mountain climbers all the time until the Meyer brothers conquered it one hundred years ago. One finds the evening gossipers of the Curacao scarcely less fascinating when they focus on their talents on the nearer regions, for distant meadows are not always the greenest, agreeable things are to be heard of the Shanigi Plat, whither it appears you journey by cogwheel railway up steep gradients in an observation car behind a violently puffing locomotive, past pretty toy stations, around dizzy corners, through the startling blackness of unexpected tunnels, 
and so on out and up to the giddy plateau and an overpowering prospect of snowfields misty valleys gorges and cataracts upon which you gaze in spellbound astonishment from the comfortable terrace of the alpenrose from no other viewpoint they tell you does the stupendous monk seem to stand out so squarely in the middle distance in his cowl of snow playing his traditional role of discouraging duenna between the coveted jungfrau and the eager eiger whom he repels with an eternal arm of glittering blue ridge ice when a conversation takes up grindelwald it becomes so attractive that you make a mental note to go there the first thing in the morning it seems you are to take one of those droll coaches of the bernese oberland road marked bay o bay and proceed delightedly up the green valley of the luschein very soon will loom before you the bleak shoulders of the wetterhorn seared and precipitous capped and pocketed with snow the overwhelming period of the eiger fearful with gorge and chasm the regal jungfrau immaculate and stupendous and most uncommon spectacle of all the awesome inspiring glacier a frozen tumble of scarred boulders and grimy icebergs pierced by glittering ice and ridged with terraced ways from which you stare down into yawning black gulfs that are fringed with giant icicles pendant from the frozen ledges what was it colored said of glaciers torrents methinks that heard a mighty voice and stopped at once amid their maddest plunge motionless torrents silent cataracts but many there will be at the cursal to tell you such tales of the enchanted lauterbrunnen valley as to incline you to reconsider any resolution about going first to grindelwald there it is clear we are to find quality rather than quantity a narrow ravine through the mountains carpeted with the greenest turf and hung with glorious waterfalls that come tumbling down from lofty limestone precipices we are to drive beside a turbulent stream set with occasional chalets whose projecting roofs will suggest broad-brimmed hats jammed down over their eyes and here and there we shall come across a white stone church shortly there will be raging leaping torrents all about us vaulting down great cliffs of strange and startling appearance and a vista of wonderland will open before us with a stately steinberg enthroned in the midst next climax on climax the incomparable staubach before this queen of cataracts every other hanging thread is instantly and hopelessly dwarfed as it launches its wreaths of dangling water smoke from a thousand feet above we shall think this dust brook a more feathery spray fluttered on a capricious breeze so astonishing is the evidence of the resistance of the air and the friction of rocks back of it but once we have gone behind it and observed the perpetual iris made by the sun in shining through it will appear a wonder beyond classification byron fancied it the tale of the white horse wordsworth called it the sky-born waterfall and goethe's dripping song of it runs in clouds of spray like silver dust it veils the rock in rainbow hues and dancing down with music soft is lost in air lesser lights are to be found among the curacao heroes who will confess to nothing more unusual in the way of activity than salmon fishing in the neighboring lakes or bagging red partridge and hazel hens in the upper meadows but these by contrast appear sportsmen of so mean an order that the stranger who has fed fat on the succulent yarns of the munchausens receives with impatience information for which in fact he should be grateful for instance that in the winter the thermometers of the higher settlements get down to fifty-four below freezing and yet the dry air keeps people warmer than in the valleys and that the snow falls in such incredible quantities that artificial lights have to be used in the lower stories of the houses all day and trenches cut for exit that up there when terrific phone blows from the south no man can make headway against it but must lie flat on his face and hang on and then jump up and dart forward a few yards between gusts that those people can foretell the weather by changes in the color of the ice blue meaning fine green for snow and white for fog that the alpine crows of the summits are dark blue with yellow beaks and red feet and the wall creepers are gray as mice 
with white and red spots on their wings, and with beaks shaped like awls. At some such point as this the stranger will rise with a yawn and go away in disgust, annoyed at being taken for a credulous fool. The seed, however, has been sown, and it flourishes like the fabled mustard. The new arrival becomes a confirmed zealot and burns with all the ardor of a convert, albeit his brain is a confused and bewildered muddle of harsh-sounding mountain names, all apparently ending in horn. When he comes out on the lawns, he finds the guests still thronging the verandas, although it is nearly eleven, and prodigies of mountaineering are slated for the morrow, and he hears the band still engaged with Puccini and the latest Vienna successes. In the fragrant dewy gardens, fountains are playing, and lovers are discreetly screening behind clumps of flowering shrubs. Returning excursionists are exceedingly vocal over the illumination of the Geisbach, whence they have just arrived in one of those pompous lake steamers, whose sure and cautious pace reminded the satirical Victor Tissot of the dignified motion of a canal boat. To hear these enthusiasts, this appears to have been one more of those exceptional occasions that the absent are always missing, and that the renowned waterfall never before roared and tumbled and foamed half so extravagantly in making its long mad plunge through the dusky dark green firs. Out on the Hoveg, a walking party in knickerbockers and hobnailed shoes, and with Edelweiss stuck in green felt hats, are flourishing the alpenstocks and driving bargains with sunburned guides whose names, undoubtedly, are either Melchior or Matthias. These latter, we are to learn, are of a fearless but canny and laconic nature, economical as gypsies and punctual as executioners. How keenly people take their pleasures in the sparkling evenings of Interlaken! How sharp and distinct are sounds and sights, and how varied the night life! Each little street is gaily illuminated as though for some special celebration, and so hearty with good cheer that one looks for some band of Bernese wrestlers, returning in triumph from a festival, to round the next corner and strike up that clarion anthem, Stay fest, O Vaterland! It would seem as though the Fete du Miet must actually be in full swing right here, instead of afar in the upland pastures. Even at this hour a joyful multitude still streams along under the Hoveg's century-old walnuts, hatless, radiant, and babbling in every European tongue. They flock about the confectioner's stands and in and out of the curiosity chalets, greeting acquaintances with eager pleasure and proposing jolly plans for tomorrow. Each little shop seems selling to capacity. Occasionally a peasant girl passes, brusque and stolid, in short skirt and bright bodice, with V-shaped rows of Edelweiss buttons. Out on the green Hohenmatte, lively groups loiter about aimlessly, and somewhere in the vague distance, someone is singing the ever-popular Tristim Morganatar. The thickly wooded Rugen seems a colossal black mastiff asleep with its head between its paws. Away up in the misty valley, whose vital air is so sweet with refreshing odors, and so soothing with soft music, the regal Jungfrau looms in dim and spectral outline, as ghostly and deceptive as any faint feathering of cumulus clouds. A distant yodel, or the lilt of a plaintive rand de vache, excites cordial thoughts of this fair Helvetia and her strong and devoted people. I wonder, a friend once said to me at Interlaken, if these men and women really appreciate how lovely their country is. Perhaps the best answer is to be found in the desperate resolution with which they have held it for six hundred years. Our necessity has taught these brawny mountaineers, who Mr. Ruskin ungenerously called ungenerous and unchivalrous, that to be painfully economical is wiser than a chance privation. One thinks with wonder of the hardships endured by the herdsmen away up in the mountain pastures, eating his sweetbread and draining his milk-filled wooden bowl in a rude pine hut with goats and kine for comrades, and for his sole diversion an occasional glimpse of a leaping chamois, a sly mountain fox, a white hare, or the whistling rat-like shadowy marmot. 
With his long alphorn he calls the cattle home or sounds the vesper hour until the loud echoes shout back from the snowfield and ice gorge and the great ravens swerve in their swimming flight. In summer, fluttering clouds of butterflies will drift above the pansies and alpine roses and gentians on this meadow, but in winter the pallid, velvety edelweiss is all the huntsmen will find on these frozen ledges. What a wild and tragic region it must be when the last sen has driven his herd down into the valleys, and old winter is in undisturbed possession of his dear domestic cave. The herdsmen may rejoice that he is not there then, for it becomes a world of black and white, of illimitable snow and blotches of black forests, of death and waste, and the frightful stillness of stupendous heights. Then it is a deserted realm of ice and snow set with pitfalls of treacherous crevasses and dreadful perils from hidden gulfs and pitiless avalanches, a shuddering space of cloud banks and waving vapor scarfs, a haunted borderland of sinister shapes and the writhing mists like wraiths of alpine legends. Even so, hundreds of failing foreigners go a long way up in those forbidding regions in the winter for an enthusiasm of the blood and a fairy titillation of the nerves, and when the days are bright and of their peculiar crystal clearness, and the skies are a cloudless blue and the sunshine a deluge, these invalids revel in skating and curling and the hockey they call bandy, and will even try appalling flights by ski and toboggan through the nipping and eager air over smooth trails of glistening snow, rivaling the records of the blue ribbon Schallstatt course at Davos, where they do the two-mile run in something under four minutes. There is a chance observation in Silas Marner that youth is not exclusively the period of folly. Of a summer evening, however, it might not be altogether unpleasant in some parts of that cloud land. Could we return with the happy little mule boy who has just now come yodeling down from the passes, doubtless we should find the sound of goat bells both romantic and soothing up there, and might even in time muster a respectable show of excitement over the passage of the four-horse diligences as they rattle by in storms of dust. Certainly we should come across many a charming little wayside inn far up those winding roads that climb to solitude, and they would have overhanging eaves and curved wooden balconies and boxes of rich orange nasturniums before the tiny windows with the lozenge panes. And when we pushed open the door and walked in, there would be a great stone stove in a bar parlor and the face of William Tell on an old clock behind the door. One reads in Hyperion of a stolid Englishman so far forgetting his cherished reserve as to exclaim, This interlocking, this interlocking, it is the loveliest spot on the face of the earth. It is a nice question as to whether anyone might not easily be guilty of like enthusiasm, provided the time were evening, and that he were capable of responding to something of such passionate sympathy for mountain and valley as breaths through Schiller's Wilhelm Tell. It is impossible not to be moved by such unusual beauty or uplifted by such sublimity. Here jangled nerves recover rhythm and dulled interest vitality. Boredom and ennui fall away, and work and responsibility acquire new value and luster. In the still of these pine-scented evenings, luminous with enormous stars, and keen and sobering joy of life, takes full and welcome possession. Here, if anywhere, the sun of youth will have its afterglow. There is something like benediction in a night vision of the magic Jungfrau, peerless bride of quietness. With such an appealing spectacle in view, what wonder that the houses have so many windows, or the night a thousand eyes. It is a master touch to Interlaken, completing and glorifying the picture as it banks the far end of the valley with towering clouds of snow. Neither Mont Blanc nor the Matterhorn may rival this Queen of the Alps, so charming in outline, vast in bulk and ravishing in purity. It could not fail to dominate any region of earth, and Interlaken acknowledges its supremacy with a completeness that is not without a certain flavor of proprietorship. Each hillside has its view pavilion, belvedere, or simple clearing, like so many chapels for devotion. We come each morning for our sunrise view, 
pass the day in adoration, marvel at sunset and the afterglow, and close the evening with a wondervist contemplation of the phantom peak and moonlight. Of these stations of the mount, the afterglow is the climax. Nor is the reason far to seek, once you have stood among the awed and reverent throng that crowds a Hohenmate each late afternoon, and have seen black night about you in the valley while for an hour or more after the snowfields of the Jungfrau summit still continued to blaze brilliantly in full sunshine. And then, as we watched, there came the color miracle of glittering white merging into every hue of the rose, into scarlet stains and a deluge of crimson, into deepening tints and somber shades of blue, and finally, fading gradually into a misty, grayish, cloudy shadow, as the last fires burned out, the great mountain paled to a phantom of the night. When daylight dies, the azure skies seem sparkling with a thousand eyes that watch with grace from depths of space the sleeping Jungfrau's lovely face. How spirit-like, how faint and fair the magic mountain swims at night among its silver cloud veils! What serenity and majesty invest it! Did God here plan another flood, and stay his hand when he had heaped an angry ocean into this dread tidal wave and left it piled in suspended motion, with giant frozen seas, furious with foam, mounting to that appalling crust that seems to dash its icy spray against the very skies? No man may look with undaunted heart upon the chaos of its glittering snowy plains. Vast, chaste, and spectral in the moonlight, how base and contemptible appear the petty pursuits of man in presence of such thrilling sublimity. It reconciles him to his lot in life, where his much is really so very little, and inspires courage and shames the heart from low, ignoble ends. There is reverent awe in thoughts of the breathless hush of the far white veils no man has trod, the remote and shuddering abysses into which the very birds of the air look down with affright. There is magic of inspiration and sublime aloofness, as with those unheard melodies that are sweetest, those supremest joys that lie beyond attainment, through the hidden echoing caverns of this fair pallid mount, wan spirits of snowland may even now be dancing. Along its lonely, lovely glades are horns of elfland faintly blowing. Of its profoundest and most secret mysteries, not even the friendly moon may have too curious knowledge. Mysteries unknown of man since first the morning stars sang together. End of section 10. Interlochen. Recording by Keith Salas. Chapter 11 of Around the Clock in Europe, a Travel Sequence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Around the Clock in Europe, a Travel Sequence by Charles Fish Howell. Chapter 11. Venice, 11 p.m. to midnight. A July moon over a gondola under, a tenor lilting a baracole, thousands with you on the Grand Canal. Venice a festa. From a nearby belfry, a clock booms eleven. Eleven! And we are only to the Foscari Palace. An hour ago, we started at the Rialto, a thousand gay gondolas with bunting lanterns and greens, everybody jostling, singing, and shouting, and in the center, like the queen jewel of a tiara, the brilliant barca filled with orchestra and singers and ablaze in a myriad of colored lights. This is a great occasion, the Serenata Ufficiale. The festa of the Redentore is near its close. Church portals hang with mulberry branches begged by the monks of St. Francis, and the people have feasted royally on the luscious black fruit bought at the little stands on the Geodeca quays. Last Sunday, the priestly procession and full canonicals crossed the bridge of boats to the Geodeca on its annual pilgrimage to the Church of the Redentore. 
Venice thus sustains her reputation as a reverencer of traditions. They are burning lamps still in San Marco Cathedral for an innocent man who was put to death hundreds of years ago. And so the Church of the Redentore is packed to suffocation at least one day of the year. And after that, with the religious rites off her mind, Venice suddenly gives up trying to look solemn and bursts out into the joy and tumult of the official serenade. This year it is splendid. Every moment belated gondolas are arriving like a flock of black swans with fresh quotas of enthusiasm and an increase of gaiety and confusion. What laughter and fun! The canal is a hopeless jam. Dancing lanterns play light and shade on thousands of bright faces, and the gondoliers, in fresh white blouses and blue sailor collars, look like shadows as they lean silently on their long oars. In the intervals of the music, there's something weird and frantic to both their labor and their language as they agonize to protect their beloved boats from scratches and smashes and at the same time retain positions of vantage in this ice flow of a tangle as the barca struggles forward a few difficult yards to its next point of serenade. There are ten or a dozen of these serenade points and at each the writhing flotilla pauses and singers and orchestra provide the entertainment. It is finest to be afloat but oh, the land, red and green fire throws into enormous relief fairy-like towers and turrets that have figured in song and story for a thousand years. And at window, terraces, balconies, and tops, there throngs a multitude that none of us may number. Every face is turned toward the barca. Every handkerchief waves our way. An occasional searchlight darts impartially over them at us picks out a spot in sudden brilliance, and as suddenly drops it back into blacker obscurity. But in that brief flashing, scattered friends have discovered friends, and gondolas are started inching toward each other, and presently parties are joined in iceboxes uncovered. After covertly studying the apparently aimless movements of our own gondola, I finally unearthed a dark conspiracy in the reunion line that interested only Paolo, our gondolier, and an occasional crony at a neighboring oar. Paolo's face and manners are innocence itself, but his guile is fathoms deep. We could not understand why he did not get us nearer to the barca, the universal objective, until we saw the bottle pass between him and a raven-haired, flashing-toothed athlete at the nearest oar, and surprised the quick greeting and low musical laugh of congratulations and content. But who minds with Venice a festa? And Venice is Paolo's, not ours, alas. Night on the Grand Canal. What a realm of witchery. The horns of Elfland, faintly blowing. What lullaby could soothe more sweetly than the dip of the oar or the soft plash of the dark water under the gondola's prow. The charm of unreality invests the shadowy, spiritualized palaces rising like silver wraiths from the quivering stream. The summer moon touches each carven arch and column, each stone lace balcony, each fretted embrasure, each delicate ojave window and sculptured capital. And lo, a magician's wand has reared a dreamland of unearthly beauty. In the soft and odorous darkness, the birds that love this Venice are securely nesting. The gulls that in winter whirl up the canals with harsh clamors of the coming storms are now at rest along the beaches of their blue Adriatic. The swallows and pigeons are sleeping among the red tiles of the crooked gables. The sparrows are aloft among the mulberry trees of the Geodeca and the sycamores of the public gardens. The canaries are dim spots in fragrant magnolia trees or in spreading beds of purple oleander, and the ortolans, robins, and blackbirds nestle among azaleas and the heavy festoons of banksias. All their music now is hushed, and they are as mute and soundless tonight as were their awestruck sires long centuries since, when gentle St. Francis read them his offices under the cypresses of Del Deserto. The night is fragrant with the breath of roses, carnations, and camellias from palace gardens, 
and with spicy honeysuckle from the neighboring Zateri. Visions of stirring romance and adventure crowd in on the mind. Down the pebbly paths of yonder garden, surely some lover has just passed, brave in velvet doublet and silken hose, from laying his roses at the satin-slippered feet of his lady. Presently he will drift this way in his cushioned gondola, and the soft night winds will bear her the mellow throb of his guitar, and many a plaintive sigh of love in Venice. But hush, from out that old black water gate in Bravo's cloak and with muffled oar, who bears the helpless lady away through the deep shadows under the garden wall? Hard with your oar, my gondolier. A purse of golden ducats if you speed me to San Marco. I shall slip this scribbled note into the lion's mouth. Ho, for the vengeance of the ten. If it were day, what a different scene we should have on this twisting sea serpent of a grand canal. Venice would then be a sparkling vision resplendent with every sea charm, tinted with pinks and opals and pearls, and as changeful and full of caprice as any other coquette. Instead of this spangle of stars above, we should have a vast expanse of pale blue sky, cloudless and glittering, and the misty reflections that now sink faintly deep down into these dark waters would vanish before a stream so azure and brilliant that it would seem as if a portion of the sky above had been cut and fitted between the palace fronts below. And how these mellow old churches and houses would glow, and their wavering shadows shake in the stream. The exquisite traceries on balcony, arch, and column would seem carven of ivory, and from under the red-tiled eaves, grim heads of stone would stare down over the sculptured cornices and peep out through delicate quatrefoils and creamy foliations. And into these wonder palaces, the eager sun would peer to see the lofty ceilings all frescoed and gilded, the floors of colored marbles, the carven furniture and faded rich hangings and the deep and arched recesses that overlook the gardens in the rear. And what gardens? Mellow brick walls festooned in pale blue wisteria and lined with hedges of white thorn, a solemn cypress in either corner, clumps of fig trees and mulberry and golden magnolia, airy grapevine pergolas of slender, osier-bound willow, little paths snugly bordered with box, trellises of gorgeous roses, and here and there some antique statue or rude stone urn half hidden in color masses of scarlet pomegranates and snowy lilies. The day life of this famed waterway is very gay and picturesque. Here is both energy and idleness, and jolly friendships and laughter with light-heartedness. Deep-laden market scows pass ponderously by, piled high with fruits and vegetables, the rowers singing at their oars or shouting voluble greetings. Fishermen step slowly along, balancing baskets on their heads. Swarthy, black-eyed women in dark skirts and gay neckerchiefs with mauve-colored shawls falling gracefully from head to waist throng the Riva shops and bargain over purchases with violent gestures and eager earnestness. Priests returning from Mass in rusty black cossacks loiter among the noisy groups and are received with profound bows and reverent touches of the cap. Husky, barefooted girl water carriers, known as the Bigolanti, stride by with copper vessels hanging from the yoke across their shoulders and offer you a supply for a soldo. Up the intersecting canals, endless processions are passing over the arching bridges, and you pause, perhaps, to observe the varied life from a place by the rail. Girl bead stringers with wooden trays full of turquoise bits. Garrulous pleasure parties off for the Lido. Laboring boatmen breaking out into song. Old men and women shuffling along to gossip and quarrel around the carven wellheads of the little campy. And now and then some withered old aristocrat on his way to have coffee and chess at Florian's, and then a solemn smoke over the Gazzetta di Venezia, before the Café Orientale and the warm morning sun of the Riva of the Schiavoni. How well the Foscari Palace there looks by night. The Foscari Palace. Poor old Foscari. It is a sad but glowing chapter his name recalls. Here lived the great doge, the last serene of all their serenities. Grown old in power and worn with foreign wars, 
his heart broke over the treason of his worthless son, and the helpless, sobbing old man, no longer of use, was deposed by the ten in his tottering age. The very next day he died, and there, in that palace, just now when the red fire glowed, a pale campanile stood out of the gloom to the right and beyond the palace. That is where they buried him, in the church of the Frari. With belated reverence and remorseful at having dishonored him a few hours since, they proceeded to make history in Venice with the splendor of his obsequies. They clothed him in cloth of gold, set his ducal cap upon his head, buckled on his golden spurs, and laid his great sword by his side. And thus, in solemn pomp, attended by nobles and lighted by countless tapers, the pageant passed out of San Marco crossed the Rialto, and came at last to the church of the Frari. And there, what is left of Doge Foscari lies to this day. It is not a poor place to be in either. The bones of Titian and Canova are beside him. A Titian masterpiece glorifies the choir, and on the opposite wall are two altarpieces of Bellini's so lovely as to mark the very zenith of Venetian art. A pause in the music of the serenade brings us suddenly back to the Venice of tonight. A vast scramble is in progress. We jostle and scrape forward another few yards. The barca sends a light hose spray to right, left, and in front in a desperate attempt to clear a passage. Dilatory or helpless gondoliers are lightly sprinkled, and all those of us who a moment since had been envying their good positions now basely give way to howls of joy. No use to struggle, all gondoliers are alike in such a crush. A champion Castellani is no better than Paolo, if he is strong enough to bend copper centesimi pieces between thumb and finger. Presently we stop. The tumult rages good-naturedly and jolly as the jockeying goes on for improved positions. And then there falls a sudden silence. A tenor is singing the Tiel e Mar of La Gioconda. You lie at full length on the cushions, the gondola lifting slowly with an indolent sway, and under the spell of the dreamy, witching music, you watch the smoke of your cigar as it drifts up and over and out and away toward the little streets in the dark. Ah, little streets of Venice, under whatever name of Cale or Corto or Salezada, you are just the same, bedraggled and delightful. What rare surprises are always reserved for each revisit? An overlooked doorway, a balcony, some sculptured detail. If the house fronts are plastered and patched, still they are picturesquely discolored. If the fantastic windows are out of plumb, the gay shutters nevertheless are charmingly faded, and there are pretty faces behind the bars. The roofs let in the rain, but how rookish and rickety they are. The battered doors are low, but they have knockers that are ponderous and imposing. Nameplates are surprisingly large and keyholes deep and cavernous. The stirrup handled bell wires run almost to the tiny iron balconies, away up under the oval windows of the eaves, those little balconies that for ages have never refused sympathetic regard for the hum of slippered feet on the stone pavements below. And there are weathered storefronts with corrugated iron shutters and gilt signs on blackboards. And under your feet in the pavement are odd little slits for water to run off in that remind you of openings in letter drops at home. There, too, are the shops whose modest output arrays the Venetian poor to such advantage. And there are the stores and markets where they bargain for a frittole of white flour and oil or polenta of ground corn and personally pick out their sardines at ten for penny or indulge in a fine brunerino as large as a trout. There one sees picturesque lanterns and gay little window boxes full of flowers away up among the chimneys and tin water pipes. The rooms perhaps seem dark and gloomy to us of modern houses, but you stop with a thrill of delight at the happiness in the voice that carols a gay air from Traviata somewhere in their depths and you look up with a smile at the bright bird that loves that dark cage. Some carping and fussy visitors may compare these rude homes to the dungeons under the leads beyond the Bridge of Sighs, but how could they consistently be other than they are, venerable and dirty, 
with splotches of paint and charcoal markings and half-effaced pencil drawings of cracked plaster full of holes, and all toned down by time and weather to a uniform mellow gray. Of course, such critics accept, with all Italy, the proud ones with the marble tablets that tell that Marco Polo lived there, or Petrarch, or Titian, or Garibaldi, but the nameless and undistinguished many are quite as worth preserving. This one appreciates the inspiration of the authorities and applauds their industry in profusely tacking up those little ovals of blue tin with the jealous warning in white letters, Diviete di Efficione, that is, don't spoil these walls with placards. So peace, harping Philistine, to whom nothing is ever hallowed. Though your emotions are thin and your enthusiasms a chill, respect these little byways, and not for themselves, than for what they bring you, to fascinating curiosity shops of the antiquarians up the back courts, to charming campy, where you stand by graven wellheads, wonder whist in the lengthening shadows of historic churches, to lichen-grown bridges, themselves pictures, arched over sunny canals overhung by gabled windows and flanked by garden walls pale blue with wisteria. Or, could you have forgotten? To nothing less than the great piazza itself and glittering San Marco, the supreme jewel casket of the world. But the wistful Ciele Mar is ended, and we move along to opposite the Academia, treasure temple of Venetian art. You uncovered just then, my comrade of the night, and out of reverence to the Titian assumption, I dare say, I uncovered two, but it was to the Madonnas and Saints of Giovanni Bellini. Do you know them well? No? Not the Santa Conversazione? Ah, then life still holds a delight in reserve for you. A sudden great and universal hush has fallen on canal and shore. Another tenor, sweet and vibrant as a bell, breathes that tenderest of all serenades, the one from Don Pasquale. At all times irresistible, it seems doubly so now. The faces that you see are grave and eager and transported. The silence and rapt attention is a tribute beyond words to composer and singer. And where else but in Italy would a multitude hush to a whisper when music sounds and break into wild tumult when it ceases? A few weeks here, and one comes to understand that music is the very breath and life of these people. The vagabond Venetian, penniless but happy, comes out of his doze in a corner of a sunny riva, and before his mouth has settled from its yawn, it is rounded into a song. A bottle of cheap wine, a loaf of bread, and a guitar provide joy enough for an army in the family parties of the poor that float out onto the lagoon in rough market gondolas at sunset. Verdi and Rossini make work light for women, walk to business with the men, and hum comfort and courage all day. And so one needs to be discreet and silent when a solo begins or be prepared for an instant and tempestuous rebuke. But there seems to be little need for a warning tonight with the hand of Venice so strong upon us. Between serenades, one takes his ease on the cushions and looks about on the people around him. Someone begins to whistle the jolly old Carnival of Venice, and it is promptly taken up on all sides bolder spirits even venturing upon the variations. A German gives us the fatherland's version, about the hat that had three corners. An enormous Spaniard near at hand bellows a fragment of I Pagliacci and is thunderously applauded. His friends, embarrassed but elated, urge him on to a second effort, which is received with indifference. On his third attempt, he is hissed, such as the caprice of an open-air audience in Italy. The jolly stag party in the gondola to the right presses upon us the hospitality of the capacious hamper, which we decline with a thousand thanks and in gestures more intelligible than our pigeon Italian. At our elbow, two slender American women in black provide excellent eavesdropping entertainment. Here is talk to our liking, thrilling with the names of men of fame who knew and loved this Venice. Just over there, Helen, is the palace where Browning lived and died. What an elaborate place for a poet. Howells lived next door, you know, when he wrote his Venetian life. 
These places are ever so much finer than the one farther down where Goldoni wrote his comedies. Oh, don't you know the Goldoni house? It is this side the Rialto, just opposite the Byron Palace with the blue-striped gondola posts. I think, says the other, that the memories are quite as rich farther on. At the Hotel Europa, you remember Chateaubriand once lived and so did George Eliot. And from there you can see the Danielli where George Sand and Alfred de Musset sought happiness but only found misery. At the mention of the Europa, the face of her friend is transfigured, and her own hearts beat high in sympathy with the reverence of the lowered voice. Wagner wrote Tristan und Isolde at the Europa. He died in the palace where the three trees stand, away down beyond the Rialto. O oh, deathless Venice! O oh, universal love! They marvel at this elfin world, the English father, mother, and son in the gondola ahead. It is a mode of mind, or a form of hypnosis, a psychological phase. The boy turns from the distant fairy candles of San Marco and regards them with amaze and disapproval. His enthusiasms are keen and a quiver, and the freshness of life's morning is on his face. Don't analyze, he says. Just breathe it and feel it. The parents exchange amused glances and smile indulgently. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, quotes the father under his breath. But we know, and they know, that they have been answered. Gorgeous silks and priceless tapestries and rare oriental stuffs have doubtless often hung from the balconies of the palace on the right in the great gala days of the wonderful past when the carnival lasted half a year. The law had not yet ruled that all gondolas must be a uniform, solemn black and the cradle-like boat of today. For all its brass dolphins and carven scenes from the Jerusalemi Liberata would have cut a sorry figure beside the sumptuous ones of an earlier time. With their mountings of silver and gold, profusion of rich colors, upholstery of enormous value, and bearing owners of fabulous wealth, whose names were written in the city's book of gold. Ah, those were the triumphant days when foreign princes waited, half a hundred at a time, to have the judgment of the Venetian Senate on the affairs of their state, when royalty was no unusual spectacle on the piazza of San Marco, when the argosies of the world with portly sail came to anchor in these waters, when Dante and Petrarch were received as ambassadors, when the admirable Crichton would be tossed a hundred ducats for amusing the Senate with an extemporized Latin oration, and when his serenity, the doge, on ascension day, fared forth in dazzling splendor to espouse the sea from the throne of his sumptuous Bucentoro. The glory of that old and powerful Venice can never pass from the memory of men. Whole libraries preserve it in imperishable record. It is interesting, too, to note how it affected bygone visitors just as it does us today. As when one turns the pages of John Elan's diary and smiles to see how soon it was after his portmanteau had been visited at the Dogana Customs offices that he pronounced the Mercaria to be one of the most delicious streets in the world for the sweetness of it and learned with amaze of the skill and rapidity of Venetian artisans who, while King Henry III of England was one day visiting the arsenal, built a galley, rigged, and finished it for launching, and cast a cannon of 16,000 pounds and put it on board, and all while his majesty was having luncheon. There was, indeed, a great deal of the marvelous about men who could contrive at glass goblets so sensitive as to betray the presence of poison, or who could at so early an age make such exquisite books as the Aldean classics, to the despair of publishers for hundreds of years to follow. Just now, in the fitful glare of red lights, hundreds of eager Venetian faces, transported, as always, by the spirit of carnival, were seen in excited groupings in every nook and corner of the neighboring fondamenti. One thinks how different is the present scene from those these people are accustomed to look upon on other nights. You would find them then in the little family squares whose corners are shrines of the Virgin set with flowers and illumined with candles. 
Husband and wife will, perhaps, have spent the early evening in gallery seats at the Teatro Goldoni, and Giovanni, weary with a long day at the Traghetto, would have finished thumbing the headlines of the day's Ladriatico, and would now have his friends about him. And Maria would let the Bambino stay up a little longer, and all would feast with prodigious merriment and satisfaction on the ever-popular soup o pidoci, which is mussel broth flavored with spices to be followed up by Chioggia eels and white wines of Policella. Neighboring women would, of course, drop in for their dearly loved gossip, hatless, with silver pins fastening their blue-black hair, coral beads around their necks, and draping shawls thrown over their bright waists. And presently, some withered old coffee roaster would drag himself in with his fragrant ovens glowing, the bright flames leaping, and toffee vendors would plead for sales. With the ease of sleight of hand, a guitar suddenly makes its appearance out of nowhere, and everybody enthusiastically joins in some haunting, languorous, dreamy velote dear to the hearts of Venetians. Just around the corner, lounging groups would be scattered before cafe doors, and voices would be humming in low, eager talk. The usual wrangling and bargaining would be in progress at the cooking stalls, piled high with fish and garlic, polenta, cabbages, and apples. In nearby Trattori would sanded floors artistic bohemia with ambition numbed by the latest African Sirocco, battens on bowls of macaroni in a turmoil of smoke and confusion. In the dark interior of a neighboring wine shop, one would find the wonderful golden browns that Rembrandt loved as a single oil lamp glows on the weathered faces of a circle of old cronies. And somewhere just at hand, a gondolier's weird and fascinating cry of Astale would be heard, and all about them Venice would be crooning her ancient lullaby in the ceaseless low lapping of water on stone steps. All together and forward once more to opposite the Church of the Salute. We have lost our recent neighbors and have an entirely new set. The changes in the grouping are like the shuffling units of a kaleidoscope. A brilliant company is gathered on the balconies of Desdemona's palace, but Othello is not among them. Another piece of calculated devilty, no doubt, on the part of the crafty Iago. Still, Portia is there from flowery Belmont, and with her are Jessica and Lorenzo. The music is now from melodious old Dinora, charmingly rendered and just as soothing as the first time one ever heard it. That salute stands out impressively in her great domes and elaborate spirals. It is beautiful, of course, by night, but then if it were day, we might run inside and revel in Titians and Tintorettos. The fantastic columns fade and flash as the red and green fires smolder or flame, and the gilded fortuna on the dome of the adjoining Dogana catches some of the glitter and generously sends it onto the seminario in the rear. Someone calls my name from among the oleanders of the Britannia Terrace, just opposite. What a delight to be known by name in this charmed city. I look up at the adjoining hotel, and there are the windows of my room, and I know that, within, in the dark, my clothing and articles of travel lie about. With secret wonder, I whisper to myself that I, after all the years of waiting and hoping, I am actually part of Venice. One might think there could not possibly be any more gondolas in all the city outside of tonight's tremendous gathering. But even now you could find them floating lazily about the lagoons, or away out toward the Lido, where the moist winds are ruffling the water, and the distant bride of the sea seems only some sort of bright exhalation. Theirs is a languorous and listless drifting, and their dim lamps waver slowly like glowworms. Little need there for the musical wails of Apremi, Astale, Little of such complaint as Byron made that the gondoliers are songless, for one could not ask for more plaintive and soothing melody than the low, passionate crooning of the barefooted boy at the oar. And perhaps, in the murky dark of silent canals, more gondolas than one are even now stealing lightly, and with love's devious purposes, under the fretted balconies of the star-eyed daughters of Venice while Beppo muffles his oar to the warning of Tom Moore. Row gently here, my gondolier, so softly wake the tide. 
that not an ear on earth may hear, save hers to whom we glide. It seems weeks since in the cool of this very morning, out at the little island of Burano, I lunched under shady locusts in the quiet garden of the crowned lion. It was a pleasant stop on the way to deserted old Torcello, Torcello that mothered Venice, but now sleeps a clutter of grass-grown ruins in the appalling stillness of her weedy canals and thickets of blackberry hedges. Within a cable length of where our gondola is now resting, a black, charry fishing bark tugs at anchor. If it were day and her sails were set, one could not help being delighted over the oranges and reds and blues of her patched and weathered canvas, the curve of the elaborately painted bow, and the spirited air of the curious figurehead. Unchanged survivors of the fading past are those stereo bragozzi of Chioggia, and one could not ask for a braver show than they present when they hoist their painted sails to dry in one long line from the public gardens to the Doge's palace. It was at Chioggia that we loitered a few days back and fed on picturesqueness to satiety. We have to but close our eyes, and there are the grizzled old fellows in red berettas, trousers rolled to their wiry brown knees, and great hoops of yellow gold in their ears. When the midday sun was hottest, we found them sitting in the shade of their fishing boat sails, mending their nets with wooden bodkins and brown twine. In the old days, when the hand of Venice was all-powerful in this part of the world, the Chiogians were the gayest and most picturesque people of these islands. Artists still consider them the purest types of Venetians, but they are a sad and melancholy lot now, as if burdened with a heritage of glorious memories. It seemed to me that the old men were the happiest living things in Chioggia. Then perhaps came the boys, then the girls, and last of all, the women, and the older the woman, the gloomier. The flirt of a sober mantilla is the nearest they ever come nowadays to gaiety. We shall never forget, nor ever want to, that wonderful sail back from Chioggia to Venice. Listening to the music on the canal tonight, the memory of it seems compact of dreams, or as the florid cloister fancy of a Middle Ages monk that we had read in some illuminated old volume bound in vellum and clasped with gold. There was all the vitalizing pageantry of sunset about us, all the immensity of sky and sea, and many a bright little island rising out of the rippling lagoon this side the marshy wastes. The yellow strips of Pelestrina and Malamoco topped the waves in two long lines like half-submerged reefs of gold. Above was a vast dome of turquoise glinted with pinks and grays, and with here and there a little heap of snowy clouds. Every phase of the wonderful sky was reproduced in the water. The sun reflected a second sun of no less ruddy fire which burned across the sea in a broad highway of shaking light that rolled to our feet. The piled and fleecy clouds were steeped in gold, and bands of purple mists across Shelley's Eugenian hills were pierced by it through and through. Venice, a mirage of the azure sea, rose slowly as we drew nearer. A witchery of towers, campaniles, palaces, painted sails, and drifting gondolas. As the dimming beauty faded with a brief eastern twilight, and we were gazing in awe on the enchanting panorama, there suddenly loomed a fresh and added glory, for just above the topmost pinnacle of stately San Giorgio floated a young summer moon. Beauty has here an abiding place. Venice is doubtless a fairer vision now, with its myriad lights, than when the only illumination was from flickering tapers before the corner shrines of the Virgin. More comfortable it surely is than when St. Roach himself was baffled by more than seventy plagues. The jaunty boatman and his perilous gondola still charm us, and dustless and noiseless the city continues musical with the cheery hum of voices and the soft shuffle of feet. In the cool twilight of the churches, marvels of sculpture and immortal canvases still inspire and enthrall. Time has added new charms to the marvels of the bell tower, church, and palace, and nature still employs a witchery scarce equaled 
elsewhere in decking the sea city with flowers. From the water lilies of the Brenta, the flaming begonia trumpets of the Geodeca, the pale sea lavender of the dead lagoon, the rose pergolas and oleander cloisters of San Lazaro, the primroses and sea holly of the Lido, wooded with odorous acacias and white-flowered catapas, and carpeted with crimson poppies and the snowy star of Bethlehem, away out to the sand dunes and lush grasses of Triporti, there continually rises an inexhaustible incense of fragrance and beauty. The serenade is nearly ended. Anticipating the coming rush at the San Marco Piazza, a word to Paolo starts laboriously toward the outskirts of the flotilla. From the royal gardens to the molo is a matter of only a dozen plunges or so of the stout oar spurred by an offer of extra leer for extra speed. Off flies our gondola, frowning as superbly as ever did swan in the eye of Keats. We dart alongside the wet quay beyond the Bridge of Sighs, and one of those old, superannuated old gondoliers called Rampini earns a pourboire by steadying the prow as we jump ashore at the base of the column of San Marco's winged lion. St. Theodore looks down placidly from the vantage point above his crocodile as we pass between these storied pillars. Fra Marco e Teodaro, as the Venetians say when they mean between pillar and post. The piazzetta is already crowded, and our hope of a table at Florian's is dwindling. Never did the stately San Solvino Library or the airy colonnades and warm Moorish marbles of the Palace of the Doges look finer. But past them we speed, with no time for the scantiest of glances at the famous quarterfoils and the thirty-six pillars with the renowned capitals, and in we hurry to the broad and glorious piazza and its flooding of light and life. Florian's is in a state of siege. Every table seems taken, and hungry people by hundreds are clamoring for places. The quadri across the square would probably have had to content us had not the efficacy of frequent pass trips saved the day, and my nightly waiter welcomes us with his dry and mirthless smile and slips us into a snug harbor under the very guns of the enemy. My companions are officers of the American squadron, now lying at Trieste, and they pass their professional opinion that the strategy was capital. But, though officers, they are young officers, and Venice has captured them hand and foot. Scarcely have we completed our supper order when the flowing strains of the coronation march from the prophet roll in from the molo in the barcus good night. And as if we were riding in on that splendid musical tide, the noisy, jubilant host of the festa comes pouring upon us. And what a fascinating spectacle does this grand, unrivaled old square then present. Were Byron here tonight, he would still have to call it the pleasant place of all festivity. No chance now to study the designs in this vast flooring of marble, or to coax a half-persuaded pigeon onto your shoulder. In every part of its two hundred yards of arcaded length, set with storied architecture so inspiring by beauty and association that it moved even the self-contained Mr. Howells to exclaim, It makes you glad to be living in this world. And under the blaze of its rimming of clustered lights and shops and thronged cafes, there storms and chatters a vigorous, cheery, light-hearted multitude fresh from the stimulus of the glittering water pageant. It comes in through the piazzetta with such a rush that one looks for the band and bandstand, too, to be swept the full length of the square and out under the arches of the royal palace. Such laughing and uproar, such a scirocco of gestures and hailstorm of crackling exclamations. This human tidal wave of the Adriatic pours down the middle, seas along the edges, and swirls and eddies in the remotest corners. One sees in it happy, voluntary exiles from almost every part of the world. But tonight, the festa-loving Venetians predominate. Every local type is here, from the languid patrician, come in from her country estate, and now sipping anise water here at Florian's, and the vapid and scented fashionable youths with carnations in their buttonholes, to the flashing black-eyed shop girls with red roses in their crisp black hair. 
and graceful mantilla shawls dropping back from their tossing heads, and the vigorous, smiling artisans, easy and jaunty of gait, with soft hats pushed back at every rakish angle on their curly heads. How happy and transported Maria is tonight, in her new black skirt and crimson bodice, and how the sultry red smolders through the olive of her cheeks, as her little hands whirl in a tempest of gestures and the lightnings of excitement play in her midnight eyes. And no less carried away is Giovanni beside her, proud as Colioni on the big bronze horse, though he lets her do most of the talking and contents himself with approving and quick, expressive shrugs. All classes of society are with us, rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief, and old Shylock himself, who was most of these. Dreaming of money bags. Scraps of gay, slurring song are continually bubbling over, and flashes of wit and snappy repartee go flying to and fro. Flower girls thread the press and insist upon pinning boutonnieres on the men, and street merchants move about offering everything from curios to caramel on a stick. A crowd gathers about a blind old troubadour thrumming a dirty guitar and struggling to force his rusty voice along the melodious course of some popular velote. And presently he will be led among the tables before the cafes, and centesimi in silver lira will jingle into his ragged hat. It is little enough to say that no scene ever had a more romantic setting. The quaint old Venetian quatrain does this famed spot scant justice. In St. Mark's place three standards you descry and chargers four that seem about to fly. There is a timepiece which appears a tower, and there are twelve black men who strike the hour. In the moonlight, the sculptured and arcaded old buildings glow like mellow ivory around three sides of it, and it is warmed and vitalized by bustling cafes and brilliant shop windows set with tempting snares of artful jewelry and cunningly wrought glass. Strong and proud, the great campanile towers upward into the clear night, away above the tops of the three tall flagstaffs. The sumptuous cathedral, in its wealth of glowing color and lavish adornment, makes one think of a vast heap of glittering treasure piled up by returning Venetian pirates in answer to the accustomed question, What have you brought back for Marco? One can scarcely take his eyes off its lofty, yawning portals, its gates of bronze, its forest of columns, its sweeping arches glowing in every color of brilliant mosaics, its profusion of creamy sculptures, its canopied saints and statued pinnacles, and its great Byzantine domes billowing into the purple sky. On the ancient clock tower of the Mercaria, the fierce winged lion of St. Mark's holds a resolute paw on the open gospels, and the bronze bell ringers swing twelve ponderous blows and hang up the hour of midnight on a dial of blue and gold. As they pause at the completion of their labors and look down on the sea of faces turned toward them from the piazza, they seem so nearly galvanized into life that it would scarcely surprise one to hear them shout, What news of the Argosies of Antonio? With the sparkling beauty of Venice so irresistible, yet is a terrible temptation to my companions to hurry straight back to Trieste and come over with their battleship and, like dashing naval lochinvars, force an espousal of this incomparable bride of the sea. Vain thought. It is Venice herself who has always done the espousing. Fully to possess her, it must be on her own conditions of complete surrender. How inevitable it seems at night that you must take the step, must cry out once and for all to fellow voyagers on the dead lagoons of life. Ho, brothers, no more of the drab and wretched waste for me. I am for beauty and romance. In Venice, all golden to dream. I shall dwell in this enchanted realm of Dolce Fanienti and float with my gondola into the final sunset. Companions on life's waters... Astali. End of chapter 11. Section 12 of Around the Clock in Europe, a travel sequence. This 
is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Around the Clock in Europe A Travel Sequence by Charles Fish Howell Paris Midnight to 1 a.m. Like a practiced coquette, Paris, the world's enchanteress, reserves for the supreme moments of midnight her rarest resources of gaiety and charm. Her last laughs are her best, and decidedly she is dangerous when laughing. Beyond question, her glowing eyes at midnight are wonderfully sweet and beguiling, and hers is the skill to touch the bright hours with the most delectable couleur de rose. And there is satisfaction for each desire. Would Monsieur Sup, the most amazing cuisine in the world, awaits your pleasure? Would Monsieur Stroll, the sparkling lights and rustling trees of the fairest of boulevards fairly drag you their way. When he drive, you raise your hand, a fiacre dashes up, and soon the bois and the champs Élysées, cool, scented, dewy, receive you gladly to their enchanting retreats. Would he join a revel, just a little one, Cabarets, Café Chantant, Bal Public were designed for no other purpose. Would he look on at life? Un garçon, vite, une demi-tasse, une sur la terrasse. And heart could not ask for a madder, merrier, more absorbing spectacle than that which will whirl and surge by the very edge of your little round table. Eh? Monsieur has a fancy for nature and solitude? Mon Dieu! C'est une originale, celui-là, mais... And you will find nowhere gardens lovelier than those of the Tuileries, elegant with statues and carpeted with flowers. Thus... At every point, the charmer wins. What is left but surrender? She seems the very queen of heart's desire. Of course, the night side of Paris is her most trivial side. But then visitors have always refused to take her seriously at any time. No matter how many wonderful achievements have been crying out to them all day that this is one of the most extraordinary and advanced communities to be found anywhere on the face of the earth. Still, they stubbornly cling to the conviction that all is frivolity here and that night is Paris's supreme period and pleasure seeking her most conspicuous and characteristic role. Accustomed to the droll ideas of foreigners, and bothering little about them except to find occasional amusement, Paris shrugs her shoulders in indifference and turns on more lights. Brilliant, charming, and ingenious, she creates what she prefers, an atmosphere of gaiety and beauty and the visiting world purrs about her in joy of a fascination it cannot find elsewhere and salves its own patriotism with the conclusion that this is her principal raison d'etre. As a matter of fact, the Parisians are masters of the art of living as their kitchen is the best, so is their drawing room and study. All the affairs of every day 
are handled with ease and grace, with imagination and a kind of poetic skill that adorns even the ugly and commonplace and invests them with attractiveness and charm, the cheery lightheartedness that is a fundamental trait of Parisians converts the life of their streets and parks into scenes delightful either to contemplate or share. Indeed, they often seem to be only grown-up children. So gracefully have they retained the fresh and stimulating enthusiasm of youth so rueful and pouting over a rainy day, so exuberant over a bright one. And the best of it is and that there is an infection to their high spirits that passes into the observer and clears his perception of the folly of worry and depression and shows him the value of and availableness of optimism and good cheer. Such is the glorious influence of a people whose attitude toward life is essentially one of hope and zest. And no one is going to deny that the Parisian is vain. Indeed, his attitude toward the rest of the earth, while patient and polite, is, at bottom, patronizing and even a little supercilious. And sometimes, it must be confessed, this gets on the visitor's nerves. One cannot give out admiration forever and rest content with getting none back. It is easy to understand the mood of bitter derision, into which even so enthusiastic an admirer as Edmondo de Amici's fell when he wrathfully wrote, Three hundred citizens hang over the side of a bridge to see a dog washed. If a drum passes, a crowd collects, and a thousand people in one railway station make a tremendous uproar by clapping their hands, shouting, and laughing because one of the guards of the train has lost his hat. And yet de Amicis came shortly to see that this is only the Parisian temperament, which he admired in so many other of its manifestations, and that under it lies solid qualities of the highest and rarest order. So he forgave Paris, as everyone does, and took her again to his heart, albeit, I mistrust, with reservation and a lingering grain of suspicion, and perhaps something of the foreign conviction that she is not always to be taken quite seriously. Paris, on the boulevard. To the vast majority of visitors, Paris by night means the boulevards. The beauty of these famed thoroughfares, the cosmopolitan and fascinating sea of humanity that flows through them, the means of amusement that abound and the many little refinements of comfort and elegance to be seen on every hand place them in a class by themselves among the city streets of the world. In the matter of virility, the life of the boulevards is amazing. Everyone seems to be at his keenest when he walks there. Anticipation is fairly skipping on tiptoe. The old boulevardier 
the traditional flaneur, has not been disappointed of his evening's diverting onlook these forty years or more. And he can, therefore, clothed and gloved and caned a la mode, proceed with his stroll in unhasting dignity, confident that the usual amusing spectacle will unfold itself in good time. But the new arrivals and the visitors of a few weeks show in their eager faces that nothing is going to escape them and that a thorough debauch of pleasure is the least they propose to make out of all the bewildering light and life about them. From the Place de la Concorde to the Place de la République, a laughing, brilliant, light-hearted multitude pours along all night with infinite bustle and chatter. Between twelve and one o'clock, it is at its gayest. And the theatres and café concerts have emptied their audiences into the stream, which is swollen to the very curb, and the driveways are whirling with an enormous outpouring of buses, motors, and cabs. The size of the loads the hired victorias and fiacres will accommodate is determined solely by the inclination and interest of the impertinent fat cochet in the varnished plug hat. And it is nothing to see a conveyance that ordinarily carries but two people trundling merrily along behind a sprung-kneed nag with a man and several girls piled inside and all waving hands to the crowd with the vastest camaraderie imaginable. This is of a piece with the universal high spirits and good humor that prevail along the boulevards. It is all fun and frolic, and everybody is in it. The rows of chairs and tables on the sidewalks before the cafes really make the spectators a part of the show. And the groups before the artistic little newspaper kiosks and the comfortable sitters on the green benches along the curb are, in spite of themselves, part and parcel of the big family with something of the intimacy and allied interest of a village street at fair time. And it always seems fair time in Paris by night. The profusion of lights that have won it the title of La Vie Lumière gives it an appearance of being perpetually en fête. And the ebullient crowds complete the illusion. But the grand boulevards have no monopoly of the night attractiveness of the city. All over town stretch broad, clean streets with shade trees and double lines of lights and rows of stone and stucco houses. In the main, these houses resemble each other rather closely, slate-colored, mansard-roofed, and with shallow iron balconies running full length of the second, fourth, and fifth stories. By night, they fairly exhale an atmosphere of tranquility and peace. There are, besides, hundreds of beautiful roomy squares flooded with light and set with comfortable benches that are seldom without contented occupants. Such a notable one as the Place de la Concorde is without its equal in any city. It costs the three and a quarter millions of people 
who live in and about Paris more than $70 million a year to maintain their city's reputation for beauty, and not a sou of it is begrudged. For Paris is the whole world to most of them, and many a Parisian politician had rather be prefect of the Seine and rule this town than president of the whole republic. And with what reason? It is a world city, said Goth, where the crossing of every bridge or every square recalls a great past, and where, at every street corner, a piece of history has been unfolded. Whoever turns from the boulevards for a space will learn of other kinds of life that are in full cry at midnight. What of the studio revelries of the Quartier Latin? There abound jollity and earnestness and strong friendships with few of the gilded accessories of the Rive Droite. The brightest of these scenes are often the most meager in setting. A group of jovial, smoking, singing companions, and about them an easel and sketching board, a dingy divan, a few battered chairs, a stove in the corner with the remains of the last meal, a huddle of draperies and hangings, fragments of casts and uncompleted sketches on the walls, and a corner table piled with a dusty litter of squeezed-out paint tubes, broken brushes, a magazine illustrations, a dog-eared book or two, and a generous strewing of cigarette butts. The cleanest things in sight are a freshly scraped palette and a sheaf of brushes stuck in a half-filled jar of water. And with so much of equipment, your merry, carefree artist squeezes the orange of life to its smallest drop and cares not a sou how the whole world wags, provided all is well between the Place de l'Observatoire and the Seine. And then again, were you to pass some pleasant house on a quiet avenue where an evening's party is ending, you could not help but linger under the windows in delight to hear some tender song of Massinets, some soothing bercoes of Ropartzes, a haunting plaint of Saint Sain, or a vitalizing torrent of Shamanads. And perhaps where you might most expect just such a scene as this, behind the closely drawn window draperies of some handsome apartment. There is gathered around a broad green table, a group of flushed, excited men, to whom a hard-eyed croupier is singing the abominable siren song of Faites vos yeux, les yeux sont faits, rien ne va plus. It seems quiet and peaceful enough. You could scarcely believe that there hangs above it the shadows of the little grey morgue down behind Notre Dame. Before returning to the giddy boulevards for a final petit verre and an exchange of pleasantries with café acquaintances, one likes to finish a cigar in an aimless ramble through such placid scenes as these. Not only May he so indulge the pleasing diversion of speculating over the kinds of home life that go on within these houses. But incidentally, he escapes the tumult of the maelstrom for a few calm moments and eventually sees for himself what a pity it is that so many night fascinations 
should abound in Paris and be enjoyed by so few. He may like to draw moral conclusions from the peace-loving pigeons nesting in the war-glorifying relics of the gigantic and towering Arc de Triomphe, or take satisfied note of the monuments of the victories of peace that dot the broad avenues that radiate from it. One such monument is always under the eyes of the boulevardiers in the form of that most glorious of all temples to music, the Paris Opera House. It is especially impressive by night, with the shadows, blending columns and statues in bewildering beauty, and highlights from the street lamps glinting on sculptured balustrades and cornices, chalking the edges of half-hidden arches and penciling the delicate detail of medallions and reliefs. Nor, it must be allowed, are devotees often wanting for that fair Greek temple of La Madeleine, so chaste and of such imposing dignity, rimmed with giant columns and embowered in verdure. After like fashion does night enhance the beauty of the great rambling Louvre, although this may only be Diana's way of paying tribute to the arts and of venerating the sacred shrine of a sister divinity, that serenest and sublimest of goddesses, the Venus de Milo. There is certainly something of almost ethereal comeliness by night to those long vistas of columns and arcades, to the shadowy sculptures of the pavilions, the lines of graceful caryatids, and the blustering triumphal groups of the pediments. One might fancy the Louvre wearing a look of grave disapproval over the hubbub that drifts in from the boulevards, were he not aware how carefully it treasures so many pictorial skeletons in its own closets. Boucher and Watteau are on record with infinitely worse scenes than these. But now it has the appearance of some palace capital of Shadowland, and before it, in perfect sympathy, lies its beautiful dream kingdom, the hushed and fragrant gardens of the Tuileries, fair as the golden Hesperides, fresh with fountains, silvered in patches with little shining lakes, marquetried in flowers, and peopled with shadowy forms of pallid marble. From a sane bridge, one notes the wizard liberties the reckless moon takes with the colonnaded dome of the sombre Pantheon. And more astonishing still, the magic tricks it plays with the adorned and enormous bulk of Notre Dame. Now veiling, now revealing, massive buttress and delicate rose window, some recessed arch tucked full of sculptured saints, all snugly foot to head, or a goblin band of hideous gargoyles that leer ghoulishly down from out the purple haze of the towers. One could well wish, however, for a closer view of that exquisite survivor of the Valois kings, the peerless Tour Saint-Jacques, at the first sight of which the most indifferent exclaim with delight over so rare a vision of grace and lace-like beauty, over long slender windows delicately foliated, over traceries of stone like petrified festoons, and an ensemble so suggestive of some dainty ivory carving 
a million times enlarged. With a glimpse of the round, pointed towers of the dread conciergerie comes something of the horror of the days of the terror, and one fancies ghastly forms beckoning him at the windows with white, frightened faces and hanging hair and eyes with hideous rings and delicate, praying hands upheld to passers-by, and iron bars clutched by the little white fingers of Marie Antoinette and her court. From such a gruesome fancy, it is a relief to turn and look down on the dark rippling seine and watch the wavy ribbons of light swim quiveringly out from the bridge lamps. And there, in the cool of their stone wharfs, still panting and perspiring from the violent exertions of the earlier evening, lie the fat, little, open-deck steamers that haul the lovers home. For many a happy pair this day has been dining deliciously à deux, under the gay terrace awnings of one or another of the romantic, flower-embowered inns that overlook the river all the way from Sherrington to grey old Argentuil, where Eloise, in her nunnery, fought her losing fight against love and the memory of Abelard. Some of these steamers appear alarmingly apoplectic, so that one wonders how they have managed to wheeze safely under all those low arches with the garlanded ends and past so many formidable buttresses, all sculptured cap a pie. If now you turn and look upward and about you, lo, the heaped and cluttered roofs of Paris, the most fantastic and romantic of spectacles. It is singular, almost startling, to see how they stare down as though to study you, and with apparently as much curious intentness and dark suspicion as you do them. There must be whole volumes of stories to each of them. Out of the ponderous mansard roofs, impudent, leering little dormer windows wink down and squint up, each with his rakish peaked roof like a jockey cap over one ear. And up above, even them, are whole groves of blackened chimney stacks leaning all askew, like barricades for sans culottes. You look expectantly to see miserable white Pierrot come forth, guitar in hand, and sing sadly of Columbine to the pallid moon. Suddenly, to the right, the lift of a cloud unveils the bronze dome of the solemn Hôtel des Invalides, and your heart beats high with thoughts of the marvellous man who lies under it, among his tattered battle flags, on a pavement inscribed with his victories. It is a sobering reflection that now in the darkness and stillness of that chamber, the only eyes that are looking down on his porphyry sarcophagus are those of the bronze Christ that hangs on the cross in the little side chapel of the tomb. To Paris, as smart society calls itself, spends the early summer at Trouville. All the most exclusive names of the two-volume bought in are then inscribed in the hotel registers of this recherche resort. Nor are their owners to be looked for in town again until long after the derbies have reappeared in the Hatter's windows. But while fashion is flirting on the beaches and betting on the little wooden horses of the Trouville Casino, what is left at home after 
or Paris, has gone, is quite sufficient to keep the boulevards lively. What walking space remains is eagerly employed by the tens of thousands of visitors. One may not, therefore, see the fashionable show of winter, but he finds an acceptable substitute in the vivacious summer throngs with their perpetual atmosphere of Mardi Gras. As midnight wanes and the multitude waxes, it is amusing to speculate upon the scattered sources of the innumerable tiny streams that come gradually trickling in. The outlying attractions hold firmly enough up to this hour, but the magnet of the boulevards is strongest in the end. Montmartre, you may be sure, has been up to her old tricks. What a la boute has to learn about promiscuous entertaining may be classed among the negligible quantities. Somewhere in that honeycomb of moulins, cabarets, penny shows, spectacle, reviews, tiny theatres with sensational rococo facades, and cafes with fantastic names dedicated to the riotous and the risque. Diversion is bound to be forthcoming for any amusement hunter blasé with the usual all the way down from the quaint little shops and crooked cobblestone streets of the rustic upper region above the Moulin de la Galette to the blazing pure lieu of the Place de Clichy and the Place Pigalle, there is always something on hand at midnight to amaze the neophyte. You may indulge or not, as inclination dictates, but you are pretty apt to be astonished when you look at your watch to see how long you have lingered. French ingenuity has lavished itself on every form of attraction, from vaudeville and ball public to papier mache establishments devoted to parodies of heaven and hell. The boulevard de Clichy is the heart of La Butte, but the life it pumps along its arteries flows principally from one show to another. You may settle down on a bench under the trees, if you like, and resolve to view life only in the open, in defiance of all the devils rampant in the neighborhood. But presently, a flashing electric sign shrieks out an overlooked novelty, and you find yourself saying, Oh well, since I am in Paris, etc., etc., and off you go. The excuse of being in Paris covers a multitude of sins. To do as the Parisians do serves purposes rarely indulged by Parisians themselves. It must be because everything is different here. The frolicsome party in pink stockings who dropped her heel playfully on my bashful friend's shoulder in an aside of the quadrille at the Moulin Rouge was merely turning one of the tricks that passes chic on Montmartre. She was of the assured and robust type that supports the pyramid in acrobatic feats, and the effect this had of dazing my friend arose rather from astonishment at its unconventionality and then delight at its skill. This much I gathered when he seized my arm and hurried me away and eventually choked out. Do you know, I have to keep saying to myself, Mullen, can this be you? I think it was quite as hard on him at the Jardin de Paris on the Champs Elysees when he saw beautifully gowned Paris girls step out of the crowd and go down the chutes on their shoulders, screaming with laughter in a whirl of skirts and flash of lingerie. In Paris, 
of what American would dream of trying the tricks at home that he accomplishes with the ease of an expert on and under the tables of the Rat Mall or the Café Tabarin, it is a pretty problem as to whether he has saved up a special surplus of buoyancy for this city alone, or whether he has become infected with the natural high spirits of the Parisians and discovers too late that he is unable to control them as they do. The men who want one more fling before settling down head straight for Paris. It is probable that if they could not get here, that they would dispense with the fling altogether. Nor is the Rive Gauche without its votaries at midnight. If the Latin Quarter stands for anything, it is unconventionality and comfortable enjoyment. If it is Thursday night, the famous Bal Boulier is in full blast, and visitors are gazing down from the encircling boxes upon a jolly whirl of students in velvet coats and black slouch hats, cutting fantastic capers in the quadrille with their latest bonnes and pretty models. Mimi and Musette are on the arms of Rudolf and Marcel, contented with little, happy with more. Those so disposed need not long remain uncompanioned if they take a turn among the tables under the trees of the enclosed garden, where from any cosy corner a soft voice at any moment may ask you for a cigarette. With so auspicious a start, there is no reason, if you are that sort, why you should not be swearing eternal devotion before you have finished one citron glacé. And no matter what night it is, there is the old boule mish, as always, the resort and delight of artists and students from time immemorial. Oh, would you sup? There are cafés, tavernes, brasseries and restaurants of every price and description. You can have a plat de jour, a venerable beef, and a quantity of vin ordinaire for the modest outlay of one franc fifty. And your payment is received with many a cheery merci monsieur and s'il vous plaît and hearty bonsoir and all the rest of that captivating civility that prevails to the last corner of the city. It is perhaps more agreeable to join the few remaining Henri Merger types among the crowds on the terraces of the Taverne de Panthéon or the Café Soufflot and listen to the vigorous talk that goes on over the little glasses of anisette and vermouth. It always seems to be that hour of the aperitif, pronounced by Baudelaire, l'heure sainte de l'absinthe. When the flower women and peddlers become too numerous before the café, and you are weary with declining nuts and nougats, and ten olives for two sous, you may have a look into Les Noctambules or some other smoke-laden cabaret. The old-timers will grin behind their cigars at your stung-again expression when the polite garçon adds to the price of your first refreshment a franc or so for the consommation of what was advertised as a free show. But shortly, you get the run of things and settle down to attend the chansonnier. 
who is the ox-eyed gentleman in the long beard who strides up to the consumptive piano and pours forth an original and impassioned rhapsody to our old friend, Parfait Amour. A little of this goes a long ways. When you have politely heard him through, you are apt to think better of the boulevards and to start bowing your way into the street. How still and deserted the familiar places appear, where by day is so much life and stir, and such bustling about of stout market women in aprons, such racing of delivery boys in white blouses, shouldering trays and boxes, such a concourse of the little fruit wagons they push and the two-wheeled carts they haul. In the little wine shops that dot the side streets, one sees the portly proprietors in shirt sleeves behind the shining zinc bars, polishing glasses and chatting with their patrons, who are workmen in jerseys and corduroy trousers, and cabmen in glazed hats and whips in hand. The loveliness of the Luxembourg Gardens fairly shouts for appreciation. One could scarcely linger too long under the chestnuts and sycamores, among the puffing fountains, the bronzes and marbles, the beds of dahlias and geraniums, the oleanders of the terrace, and the great stone urns that drip petunias and purple clematis. As you cross the Seine by the old Pont Neuf and lean a moment on its broad balustrade, kindly thoughts go out to the garrets that may now be sheltering those pathetic stooping figures that bend all day above the long lines of bookshelves along the quays and never buy, and you wish good luck to the good-natured booksellers, who never annoy them with importunities, but sit indulgently oblivious on the benches opposite, and smoke their pipes and read their papers. So great a love of books will at least ensure the old habitué from ever being included in that dread toll of two a day that the same regularly pays into the morgue. It is like getting home to be back on the boulevards. Gay, gleaming, brimming, and confused. The air hums with the incessant shuffle of feet on the asphalt sidewalks and the pounding of hoofs on the wood-paved streets. The eyes ache with trying to miss none of the faces that flash past, or any of the good fellowship that abounds. The bubbling current drifts one along by little kiosks all aflutter, with magazines and newspapers, by advertising pillars flaming in playbills of many colors, by crowded curb benches, glowing shop windows, and table-lined cafe fronts. The wise drop out where the red lights mark tobacco bureau and replenish their cigar supply from government boxes with the prices stamped on them, rather than pay double for the same article in a restaurant later on. As you proceed to your favorite cafe, it is immensely diverting to catch the glimpses of good cheer from those you pass. It is the same sort of thing in each case, and yet, somehow, always different. On the red divans that extend around the rooms, with mirrors at their backs, and petit verre on marble-topped tables before them, one beholds formidable arrays of bon vivants, all taking their ease with as hearty a will 
as the very kings of Yves Tau. Military men with red noses and white imperials, politicians with pervasive smiles, literati bearded like the Assyrian kings and wearing rosettes of the Legion of Honor, fat merchants in fat diamonds, and pot-hatted elegants who advertise smart tailors with as much exuberant grace as Roland himself. Happily for Paris, champagne is never out of season, and popping corks are held by many to make sweeter music than some of the orchestras in restaurant corners. The tide of life appears at flood. La belle Ninette of the Folies, très fête et très admirée, fares daintily on out-of-season delicacies, thanks to the enduring ardor of the distingué marquis opposite, and drops candied fruits with the prettiest air imaginable into the nervous mouth of her favorite poodle, who is himself rejoicing in a new silver collar set with garnets. Le séduisante Gabrielle at an adjoining table, having once been a blanchisseuse herself, appropriately excels in a toilette of cloud-like gossamer, and is quite the adored of the rheumatic old party beside her, who has probably been doting on the valet for two generations. The talk is largely of La Belle this and La Belle that, of the latest display of extravagance, the most recent spectacle, the most promising plays for the fall, or the drollest freaks of the new fashions. One sees foreign faces from all quarters of the earth, as though it were some kind of international congress with both hemispheres fully represented. Long accustomed to seeing the world without leaving home, nothing surprises Paris. A Chinese admiral, a Bedouin sheik, a Spitzbergen Eskimo, a lotus lover of Tahiti, a Russian Grand Duke, or a millionaire hemp grower of Yucatan, pass practically unremarked. It would be a matter of no comment if the owl and the pussycat went to sea in a beautiful pea-green boat. L'amour is the point of common contact, and even so, one has little chance against a rich old roué in the eyes of a première danseuse or a far vision chanteuse of the Marigny. Business flourishes in the cafes. The harried waiters are kept bowing right and left and hurry off crying, Tout sweet. Each open door sends out its vision of fluttering hands and shrugging shoulders, and one hears an incessant rapid fire of Bien, dis donc, écoutez, mais non, précisément, allons, oh la la, and so on. At Maxim's and the Olympia, you would think there was a riot. Ice pails are as numerous as pulse beats. When you reach your cafe at last, on the corner, by the opera house, Perhaps the ponderous maître d'hôtel assigns you a garçon, whose name is doubtless François, Gustave, or Adolphe, and who is very businesslike, in short jacket and white apron. To him goes your order for a filet de boeuf, or perhaps a fricando, or, better still, a sole 
with shrimp sauce. And as you await its preparation, you think with satisfaction of the self-appreciative observation of Brilat Savarin. One eats everywhere. One dines only in Paris. The life you then see about you is the usual thing here. To a stranger, novel and amusing. To a Parisian, altogether important and absorbing. An indispensable part of his existence. The setting is of soft carpets, palms, red velvet divans, chandeliers, and a crush of small, marble-topped tables. The place is crowded to the point of discomfort. A thin veil of smoke hangs over all. There are people in all kinds of street clothes and evening dress, ladies in opera cloaks, and gentlemen in immaculate white waistcoats. There are ordinary individuals and fantastic types, ruddy, portly, bourgeois, who shout, mon vieux, at each other, and make a prodigious racket generally, and nervous, old beaux, in toupees, who fancy themselves in drafts. Occupations vary. Ladies are dining on champagne and truffles. The man at your elbow is writing a letter. Another is looking through the illustrated papers. And another has called for ink and paper and is casting up the day's expenditures. Rubbers of dominoes and écarté are being played out. There is a continual running to the telephone booths and you hear the muffled calls of Allo? And all the time, an orchestra is holding forth in the corner. The clatter of chairs and dishes and the confused rattle of conversation is amazing. Wit wets on wit. Everybody has an opinion and is anxious to back it. Politicians bang their fists on the tables and address one another as citoyen. Philosophers have it out. Cartesian against Hegelian. Poets quote from their latest lyrics and are tremendously applauded. Novelists dispose of rival books with a scornful shrug and a withering mo. And the playwright, by universal concession, is supreme cock of the walk. Presently, you move a little out of all of this and have a seat near the outer edge of the terrace and begin to accumulate a pile of cups and saucers, each with the price of the order burned in the bottom. So far as out of doors goes, you are now the audience and the passing crowd the show. The number has dwindled, but in characteristics it remains the same. Sociable, good-humoured, easy in manner, and quick in intelligence. It will be seen to differ from the night throngs of other cities, not only in variety and exuberance, but in dramatic qualities as well. Camelot rush up to you, crying the latest editions of the evening papers, and suddenly, with furtive glances over their shoulders, thrust some questionable commodity under your nose and protest it is a bargain. Jolly parties sweep along, arm in arm, in lines that cross the sidewalk from house to curb. Lady visitors, with eyes full of excited delight, pause for a wistful glance down Rue de la Paix, where the establishments of famed milliners and modistes stand in gloom, little dreaming that they may be touching elbows this minute with the very chef de jupe. 
corsager and garnisseuse that they are to visit in the morning. Chic grisettes trip smiling by, who have dined frugally at Duval's on chocolate and bread to have another rose to their corsages. There are blasé clubmen from the exclusive circle of Place de la Concorde and the Champs-Élysées, and supercilious representatives of the American colony of the Boulevard Haussmann. Here comes D'Artagnan himself, capable and alert, arm in arm with blustering Porthos. Ragged voyeurs with shifty looks run to open the carriage doors. From time to time there saunters by, in cap and cape, that model policeman, the affable and accommodating Sergeant de Ville. And if you look around for a camelot then, you will find him attending very strictly to business. And so... The fascinating procession troops merrily by. Roaring students from the Boulmish, black-eyed soldiers in shakos and baggy red trousers, members of the institute, pretty working girls who handle their skirts with the captivating grace of comedienne, the shapely dress models they nickname coils, conceited figurants, from the Café Concerts, famous models, cocottes, frail daughters of Lutetia, with complexions like Italian sunsets, impudent gamins chattering in unintelligible argot, dilettanti poseurs, and the usual concomitants of beggars and thieves. What a jumble of happiness and misery! What an amazing spectacle, with the shimmer of silks and the glint of pearl, ranged beside the mendicant in his rags. What a wealth of material, too, for the capable. One sees how Balzac found the best types of his human comedy on the boulevards, why Victor Hugo tramped them day and night and read shop signs by the hour in search for characters and the names to fit them, where Zola got the misery that he put between covers, where Moliere secured impressions that he transplanted so effectually to the stage. How Dumas must have known these streets, and Flaubert and de Maupassant nor are they exhausted yet, or ever will be, where the entire gamut of the emotions is so incessantly run as here. Vital human material can never be lacking. As one o'clock wears round, it is easy to distinguish a change in the appearance of the crowd. The tumult and the shouting dies, the captains and the kings depart. Something of that wan and forlorn look is beginning to appear that makes even these buildings themselves seem dejected and remorseful. By the time the street cleaners advance to flood the boulevards and the sky beyond Père Lachaise is paling to dawn. The heart says, let's keep it up. The body says, to bed. And now, too, the crasser comedies of the fag end of the night receive their premieres. Amaryllis has lost her Colin and laments loudly with Florian. C'est mon ami. Rendez-le-moi. J'ai son amour. Il a ma foi. Mademoiselle Fifi demands her carriage 
and bundles out into it, with the red-faced Baron hurrying after, carrying her amazing hat, and off they go toward the Champs-Élysées. A stag party of revellers hails a Victoria and sinks limply onto its cushions, and they, too, head for the Champs-Élysées, with one hanging on to the cocher and reciting dramatically, Au clair de la lune, mon ami Pierrot. Everyone smiles, for they know whither they are bound. For pre Catalan, of course, in the Bois de Boulogne, where they will chase the ducks and chickens around the little farmyard and make speeches to the mild-eyed cows and recover themselves gradually on mugs of cold milk. Clearly, it is time to depart. One does not want the lees of this sparkling cup. A man is a fool to abuse his pleasures, though this may sound naive at one o'clock in the morning. Go while everything is still charming and delightful. The seasoned boulevardier can do it, for he has a viewpoint that is all his own. It is by no means that of France, nor yet that of Paris by day, but of Paris by night. His Paris. It is opportunism applied to society, not the mad, reckless, après moi le déluge, folly wrote of the late Louise's, but rather a conception of the importance of few things and the inconsequence of many. He sings with Villon, where are the snows of yesteryear? He searches the classics and has carpe diem framed. He skims holy writ and puts his finger on sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Life is poetry, quoth he, in spite of a limping line here and there. Why fuss over Waterloo, or the Place de Greve, or the guillotine, or the tumbrils that rattled up the Rue Royale? The present alone is ours. Enjoy it to the uttermost. Life is beautiful and of the moment. Lights are sparkling. Fountains are splashing. The night is delicious with fragrance and enchanting with music and laughter. Join me, he cries. I raise my glass to the lilies of France and the bright eyes of the daughters of Paris. The End End of Section 12 End of Around the Clock in Europe A Travel Sequence by Charles Fish Howell